Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jim McGraham from UCLA uh, to present uh, this uh, distinguished uh, lecture. Okay. Uh, Jim graduated uh, from Harvard University uh, with PhD, received his PhD in applied mathematics from Harvard University in 1971. And uh, after holding a research fellowship uh, in Geoffrey Dynamics at Harvard University from 71 to 74, he worked as uh, working in the oceanography sec section at the US National Center for Atmosphere Research, or called ENCA. Many of you probably know the ENCA, where he became a senior scientist in 1980s. In 1994, he became a Louis Rancher, I'm sorry, Professor of the Earth Science in Department of Atmosphere and Ocean Science and the Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics at University of California at Los Angeles, while he's retaining a part-time job in the UCA, a uh, part-time appointment in the UCA. Uh, Professor McGriam's uh, primary Areas of scientific research are the fluid dynamics of Earth's oceans and atmosphere. Both their theory and computational modeling, okay. Particularly subject include the maintenance of the general circulation, climate dynamics, geographically and claustrophically balances dynamics in rotating certified fluids. Vortex dynamics, planetary multi-layer, planetary scale thermal heat and convection, the roles of the coherent structure in turbulence flow in geophysics and astrophysics physics regimes. Numerical algorithms, statistical estimation theory, and coastal ocean modeling. So it's covered a very uh, wide range. Uh, Professor McGriam is a member of the US National Academic of Science and a fellow of American Geophysics Union, a prestigious member, uh, a fellow, a prestigious organization and membership. Okay, uh, here, please join me. Welcome, Professor Jim McGriam. Is this working? Good. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is my first trip to China. It, in the last two weeks on the mainland, which was the original purpose, and then um, you gave me the opportunity to stop here, just so I won't get an unbalanced view of modern China. Um, the subject today is, I think, entitled sub scale Currents in the Ocean. I'm going to try to set the context. It at least fits on the chart here. A very exciting time um, in science when you're actually able to work on something big and something new. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, and that's true for today's topic with uh, young lifetime or five or ten years or so, depending on how you want to count it. Um, in retrospect, it's quite obvious that this phenomenon should exist. We just weren't farsighted enough ahead of time to recognize the roles that it has to play, and that is the questions for which it's the answer. But I think we, we now understand the general context fairly well. We're pretty far along in understanding the phenomena, and although it makes for hard theory, as it is turbulent flow, um, give us 100 years and we'll get there. Um, not that we would be behind the rest of turbulence. This first chart is literally to be taken as the flow of energy in the general circulation of 
you could say the atmosphere ocean climate system, but in particular the ocean part of it. Um, but it also is by handing in some sense the flow of information in a time sequence sense, not necessarily control because the climate system is one in which the small and the large scale processes are linked and they have to somehow work together. Um, even if in a causality and energy sense, the events start at the largest scale. In the case of climate, it is the radiative forcing. By the time it reaches through the atmosphere to the ocean, it's a combination of the surface radiation balance, the surface heat and water exchange, and the surface wind stress. But all of these patterns primarily occur on large scales, essentially the scales of ocean basins. And so the forcing generates large-scale flow on the planetary scale, ocean gyres, global thermohaline circulations. That comes into equilibrium with its forcing because it is inherently unstable. The instabilities are to types of flow that are generally referred to as balanced. And that terminology means that when you look in the momentum equations, that there's a quasi-static balance between forces that are not the acceleration, and the acceleration is a small residual. And it's sometimes not that it isn't evolving, it's just you have to work your way through the, the layers of the influence. And the primary balances are hydrostatic balance in the vertical, gravity force against vertical pressure gradient, and what is called geostrophic balance in the horizontal, that is a Coriolis force associated with Earth's rotation against the horizontal pressure gradients. And the large-scale response, the balanced instabilities that create the most energetic component of the flow, at least in the general circulation, the so-called mesoscale eddies, um, are all quite well balanced. Um, they're now pretty well measured. The, the biggest advance we've had now maybe 30 years old, what has been referred to as the greatest experiment in oceanography, is to fly radar altimeters from space. They measure sea level in fairly good accuracy. You have to reference that sea level to Earth's quite convoluted gravitational field. So you have to co combine it with gravitational measurements of similar spatial resolution. You don't have to worry about the time resolution. And that gives you a surface dynamic pressure field whose gradients are the geostrophic currents. And from that, we really know the large scale system and its, call it its energy sink or its inheriting generation in a, in a causality sense quite well. But there's a dilemma <coughs> that balanced dynamics creates in theory that is now well established and well tested if you take the asymptotic limit seriously of strong earth rotation and st strong stable density stratification in the vertical, the gravitational direction, um, then in fact the turbulent evolution is such that energy should in fact go to larger scales quite contrary to the common experience of turbulence at small scales, where it goes not to larger but to smaller scales. Uh, that is, turbulence without rotation and stratification influences. And that basically means that from this conceptual perspective, you're stuck here. The energy can't go forward. If anything, it can only go backward to larger scales. And yet, kinetic energy is dissipated by viscosity on scales that are this size or smaller, and so there's no energy sink. On the atmosphere, this dilemma is not quite so acute because infrared radiation to space can be a fairly good energy sink, but there is no such large-scale energy release in the ocean, and so there is a necessity that energy get from the strongly rotational and balanced dynamics down to the microscale where viscous dissipation can occur. There's well-established theory and experimentation in 
fluid dynamics, essentially associated with the name of Kolmogorov, um, that there's a kind of general behavior of constant energy flux from a large scale source to a small scale sink when you are not influenced by rotation and stratification, and that's a perfectly valid picture at a scale of tens of centimeters. But how do you get from 100 kilometers to tens of centimeters? And so there is a gap in between that must be crossed. It, ha it gets from very strong rotational and balance control to very weak, but you need a process to get across here. And this has been recognized for a long time. Several routes have been imagined. Turbulent boundary layers against a slower moving surface, the land surface below the atmosphere, the ocean surface below the atmosphere, the ocean bottom below the ocean, do provide a, an unbalanced type of turbulence that escapes this constraint on inverse cascade. But um, volumetrically, the bottom boundary layers occupy only a very small part of the fluid, and that's not of enough of an energy sink. And the long-standing view was that there would somehow be, to use the terminology in the atmosphere, spontaneous emission of inertia gravity waves that would somehow bring energy out of the balance flows and eventually complete the link. Except that decades of work, both theoretical and observational, have essentially found this to be a generally quite weak process especially weak in the ocean where there are no cloud processes to assist it. And so there has to be some other process of breaking balance and carrying energy forward across this wide gap of scales. And that is the function in an energy information sense of the submesoscale. Now the terminology submesoscale, which is a a peculiarly oceanic terminology. Mesoscale itself is an oceanic terminology that doesn't mean the same thing as mesoscale in the atmosphere. But submesoscale is essentially the next scale down from the mesoscale, and it's what receives all its energy um, and information control um, out of the mesoscale into the submesoscale. So to start to be a little more explicit, um, I mean, for this audience, I reversed the slide order slightly because I, I think some of you don't have a substantial oceanic atmospheric experience. Um, marginal, non-trivial, but not dominating rotation and stratification influences. The scales, just to be physical, are essentially the ones that are the next step down from the mesoscale. Horizontal scales from about 10 meters, which might be a good turbulent boundary layer scale, to about 10 kilometers horizontally, vertically a small fraction of the fluid depth, um, and a time scale of, of hours to days. Although there are certain products of the submesoscale that in fact have lifetimes um, longer than the general circulation patterns have. Um, cousin of this is the great red spot of Jupiter, which I'm told has been seen for 400 years. People argue about it. I'm also told it's going away now. But nevertheless, coherent vortices can indeed be very long-lived structures, and there are classes of them in the ocean on the submesoscale that are, that are long-lived. They come from the mesoscale. If you ask what the flow patterns are, and I'll be showing you all of these, process of phronogenesis, which is known to some degree in terms of winter storms in the atmosphere, Heavy rainfall is at fronts. They draw on weather maps. Chronogenesis is far more pervasive in the ocean. There's a, a cousin of it that is a filament. It's different shapes of what a similar process is. The ocean has bottoms that rise to the top, which means that it is everywhere at all levels under topographic influence in the sense that you can move on constant entropy surfaces and encounter topography somewhere. And so 
boundary interactions with the stresses they engender and then flow separation, which enables instabilities, are another way that submesoscales are energized and then coherent vortices that I've mentioned. Forward cascade, it's a turbulence dynamics partly balanced, but not completely. It has to escape the inverse cascade constraint. There's very strong surface convergences, so one of the ways it's best seen is in organizing debris patterns on the surface of the ocean, which of course are visualizable by photographs and satellite images. Um, approximately, I mean, balanced flows in fact have very weak horizontal convergences, um, and they therefore have very weak vertical velocities, that is, vertical divergences. And so the submesoscale, in fact, are the things that provide the largest amounts of these quantities. And so they provide large vertical fluxes in the ocean, and the ocean is otherwise structured like the atmospheric stratosphere in a way that vertical fluxes are generally weak compared to horizontal ones. These scales overlap with inertia gravity waves, which have a you know, a, a more linear wave-like propagation dynamics, but they have essentially completely disconnected energy sources. They don't come out of the general circulation, they come out of things like tides and sudden storm events and, and the like. And for, peop for years, as I mentioned, people falsely imagined that this scale range was occupied by inertia gravity waves. That conviction is still fairly widespread in the atmosphere, although I'm sure it's not entirely true. Um, because all the processes I'm talking about in the ocean are generic processes and will be operating in the atmosphere sometime. And there are a lot of inertia gravity waves with different energy sources. But if there's a necessity of this scale transfer of information, and before the inference was it had to be inertia gravity wave mesoscale coupling, that just turns out to be usually weak. And so that's not the answer. Let me show you some pictures now. A lot of the pictures come from images. A lot of the way people were previously fooled about signals in this scale range is they would have something like a time series. And they couldn't distinguish multi-dimensional structure from that. But here's a surface energy image of what is understood to be lines of seaweed. It's literally a measure of well, it's a radiation measure that, that is used to produce a product that is chlorophyll concentration at the surface, and so it's a biological abundance measure. This is in the Gulf of Mexico, and you see that everything is in these little streaks, sometimes quite convoluted, sometimes long and straight. You know, this is a few hundred kilometers. This is a sort of 100 kilometer mesoscale, eddy scale. This is a scale down from that. It's the submesoscale. The submesoscale is active on the edge of the mesoscale. That is sort of the sides of the eddies, not the centers of the eddies. Here's a different image of sea surface temperature. The dimension is about 300 kilometers on a side. This contrast between warm and cold signals, which I guess here is about 4 degrees centigrade, is a mesoscale contrast. So you would say this is a warm mesoscale eddy, that's a cold one. But on, in addition to that sort of order 100 kilometer scale, you see that the temperature fields have very sharp edges, and those we'll call fronts, because very large temperature gradients will happen in small distances of, as far as this image is concerned, some 5 or 10 kilometers in a scale. But that actually is, is an overestimate because it's resolution limited. But you also see small scale fluctuations at the places of the sharp fronts. That is, these fronts themselves are subject to a second stage instability um, that you would use a language of sub mesoscale frontogenesis to make the front and then sub mesoscale instability of the front to make additional fluctuations, all of which will feed the transfer of energy down to finer scales and complete the loop of the general circulation. In this image, you only see one thing that you, or maybe two, you might point to as the beginning of an organized vertical flow. 
um, in a lot of other contexts, some of which I'll show you, you'll see much more abundant vortical flows, that is, tight recirculating flows. <clears throat> this is one of a class of historically famous images. Um, in the early stages of manned flight in space, astronauts were sent into low Earth orbit. And really all they could do, because they were, they were just like an airplane flight, you, you have to keep your suit belt on. They were strapped in their seat for days, but they took cameras with them and they took pictures out the window. And when you had favorable sun reflection, off the surface you saw images like this. And these are called spirals on the sea because if you trace individual lines, they go wrap around and circle in, and they wrap around in a right-handed way, which means that's in the same sense of rotation of the Earth, given that this is an image in the northern hemisphere off Africa. So little cyclones of a scale of five kilometers with and evidence of some sign of a surface convergence in the middle of the cyclone that pulls in the spiral. These are not the mesoscale eddies. They're too small. Mesoscale eddies are just as commonly anticyclones as cyclones. There are good dynamical reasons why there's a parity symmetry at large scales in strongly rotating stratified flows. So these are breaking that parity symmetry. Um, I, you can't prove it from one image, but People have seen hundreds of images. And furthermore, you have all these little lines. And these lines are in, understood to be biogenic debris that is trapped into surface convergence along lines. We'll see in a moment that this is, in, vac in fact, the flow configuration of a density filament, that is, a cold density line at the surface in between warmer density on the side, as opposed to a density front, which would be a step from warm to cold or, or vice versa. And that gathers in the debris, which is then flow visualization, and these filament three arms are then wrapped around these cyclonic vortices. The, in this image, you would have a sense that the um, filament widths are say, multiple tens of meters. Um, vortex widths are multiple kilometers. Um, the mesoscale is something bigger. For decades, no one had knowingly taken a ship or mooring measurement in the middle of one of these spirals on the sea. There just had never been you know, a, a, an example where people were confident that they had space-time coincidence. In that sense, they seem very mysterious, and they essentially were mysterious until we developed the, the present understanding of, of submesoscale vortical and filamentary dynamics. Now, shifting to the interior of the ocean, there's a second class of submesoscale structures. You see it here in a depth horizontal distance plot through the cross-section of what is a round blob. This is in temperature. The scale of this is you know, several degrees centigrade. So again, a, a pretty substantial scale. And assume, as is approximately true, it's roughly axisymmetric. It's measured by acoustic sources and, and receivers in a way that if you have a whole bunch of sound paths, you can do an inversion the same way that medical tomography does its inversions for mapping the interior of the body, and deduce the sound speed along the path in, in a volumetric way, resolved way, and then use the thermodynamics of seawater to convert the sound speed to temperature. So that's what you're seeing here. Now, if this were just a big hot blob, it would be buoyant, and it would rise like a convective plume. It isn't rising. It's at a level of neutral buoyancy. And the only way that can happen is that if it's, there's a corresponding high salinity blob that goes with it, 
which makes it a very salty anomaly compared to typical mid-Atlantic conditions, although this is somewhat eastern Atlantic. Where does very salty water come from? It comes from the Mediterranean because that's a high evaporation basin, low rainfall, high evaporation, and the water that comes out of the Mediterranean through the Strait of Gibraltar is denser and saltier than the water that is at its level in the Atlantic, and so it sinks down um, the slope when it gets into the Atlantic and mixes as it goes until it's mixed enough and entrained enough so that it's a level of neutral buoyancy. At that point, it is in a current flowing along the boundary, so it's a boundary current, and that boundary current then can separate and be unstable, and this is one of the instability products, um, primary instability product of such a I'll now start to connect to the previous word, topographic wake. These things are known to last for many years. They've been seen on the eastern side of the Atlantic. Um, floats have tracked them for very long periods. Um, they're weakly stratified in the interior compared to here. Density gradient is small here compared to here. That implies that this is an anticyclonic, in geostrophic balance, an anticyclonic circulation about this blob with the current maximum at the mid-level and currents decaying away above and below. So it's an interior spinning disk in that sense. Um, because it's anticyclonic and because so many other examples of these that are observed are anticyclonic, the inference is that there's mixing involved in its formation. Mixing across density surfaces, which is not a common event in the ocean. And I just mentioned the two mixing processes involved, the gravity current mixing going down the current, the, the slope when it comes out of Gibraltar, and then the mixing that comes in the submesoscale instability of the separated boundary current. And so that's how things like this are created. Here's another example of what is also being, you know, call it a submesoscale coherent vortex, because that's the terminology. This is a different example from a different place with a different formation process and detail. Um, but the same net effect, by chance at a time an experiment was being done at 700 meters depth in the North Atlantic, two boats that were neutrally buoyant and acoustically trackable were dropped very close to each other, about 10 kilometers apart. And over the next 70 days, they more or less moved together in what would be recognized in rate and scale as a mesoscale trajectory, a mesoscale eddy trajectory. And, but there's a clear distinction between one of them that shows us motions, which are anticyclonic rotations, um, in addition to the larger scale motion, while its neighbor essentially doesn't. And this shows two things. One is the scale of this submesoscale coherent vortex is very small horizontally. The other, well, three things, that it's very long lived, that you don't really see any weakening over 70 days here, and that um, well, it's anticyclonic, meaning it, it must have a mixing process in, in its generation. And again, the present thought is it's essentially boundary current instability and separation that, that does this. There are chemical anomalies in these cores. I mean, I saw you, I showed you by implication a temperature salinity anomaly in this one. Um, because people were seeing this trajectory in real time, they could drop some hydrographic profiles through it and see that, that there were strong chemical property anomalies that were, I forget, five or six sigma away from the mean in the climatology of this location, meaning that it had come from someplace very far away where that particular combination of chemical fingerprints was not anomalous. Um, and then that core water had been preserved um, through the however long trajectory um, that it underwent. So that's what they look like. 
let's come back to essentially the system framework. And these are arguments that partly were made and could have been made to more completeness ahead of time, ahead of the observations and modeling that we now have, that would say something like this has to be happening, but this is obviously in retrospect. And so what are the essential roles that sub-mesoscale flows have to play? And the first one, which is a traditional atmospheric issue, is a weather forecasting. If you take observations, you want to define an initial state that you will then use a numerical model to integrate forward to make a forecast. There was a very important lesson that had to be learned that, in fact, wasn't learned by the famous, brilliant man named Lewis Richardson, who first attempted this in the 1920s. He had a team of people doing hand calculations. There were no computers. And there were a set of measurements of surface pressure over Europe. That defined a kind of initial state. The weather forecast was then made over several days by these hand calculations. And the prediction was that there were going to be a violent storm in the next three hours. There was no storm. What was wrong? He didn't recognize that the atmosphere in the ocean on larger scales is mostly balanced. Because of rotation and stratification, he did not impose the appropriate constraints to establish balance. And so when weather forecasting began to be successful in, let's say, the 70s, 80s, 90s, they developed mathematical techniques for doing the balancing to an appropriate degree. The one that was most famous was something called nonlinear normal remote initialization. The idea that all the possible rotating stratified linear modes of the system should either be in a slowly evolving balance category or in a rapid inertia gravity wave category. And so if you would just press the inertia gravity waves in your initial state definition, then you would have an appropriately balanced forecast. This worked very well in a practical consideration. In modern technology, we, we've, they've gone to four-dimensional variational simulation. So, so they don't use this technique. They essentially use a time filter, which has much the same effect. But some people were purists, and they said, well, if this is such a good idea, it ought to be provably exact. We ought to be able, because it's a nonlinear pose problem to iterate this to convergence and show exactly what the balanced state of the atmosphere was. But when they began to do this with the real data cases, they always failed. That is, the iteration for balancing by nonlinear normal motor initialization would begin to converge for a few iterations, good enough for weather service, and then it would begin to systematically diverge. <coughs> there was a concept called the slow manifold which was the thought that there would be slowly evolving advective planetary wave flows in the atmosphere um, that would be dynamically decoupled from the fast motions like inertia gravity and acoustic motions. And so people tried to derive slow manifold equations. There are quasi-geostrophic models that do this, balanced models that do this. They have only slow solutions. But this divergence iteration failure can be interpreted as a statement of saying the slow manifold is not an invariant inertial manifold of the Navier-Stokes equations, even under strong rotation and stratification. That is, if it's a manifold, it's a fuzzy manifold, it's a leaky manifold. Balanced picture is not a complete enough picture. And of course, that's where the submesoscale gets its energy. I already sort of told the story of the global energy cycle in the same way. There has to be a leakage of energy from the larger balanced scales. This was sort of first posed in the context of theories of rotating stratified turbulence, in which for some of these asymptotically valid balanced models, Charney in particular, identified the possibility of inertial cascade ranges, generalizations of Kolmogorov's range, in which there was a, an energy spectrum that was as steep in horizontal wave numbers, k to the minus 3, 
if there were no small-scale energy sources. Um, but it has a spectral transfer function, that is the transfer of wave number across a wave number k from smaller wave numbers to larger wave numbers, the nonlinear flux of energy across scales in a Fourier description that is negative. That is, the energy flux is towards larger scales in this range. Um, Lilly had quite a bold idea that there was, essentially for reasons of stratification, an inertial range that is k to the minus 5 thirds, which is very close to the observed mesoscale atmospheric spectrum, um, with balanced flow, as long as you had a small scale source of energy in what he imagined was deep cumulus convection as being the principal source in the atmosphere, and that that would have, again, an inverse transfer function. But Lilly's conjecture was wrong on both counts. Um, and in fact, in this kind of wave number range in the atmosphere, the energy transfers forward. Um, and if it's not due to inertial gravity wave processes, then it's due to the spontaneous emergence of submesoscale flows with a positive transfer function. And a spectrum that is much flatter than the geostrophic spectrum, k to the minus 2 if it's a surface frontal regime, and k to the minus 5 thirds if it's an interior regime. But it essentially means you have to break balance. And that allows the forward transfer um, that completes the energy cycle. Another perspective is the ocean has a very strong thermohaline circulation, a global buoyancy force circulation. It's in its mass flow as large as any of the horizontal wind-driven gyres, tens of surdrips to use the volume flux ocean measure. And in order for that to happen in the presence of stable density stratification, that means in the warmer parts of the world, certainly like this one, you have to be lifting up dense water through a, sta a stable density gradient and converting it into light water rapidly enough to essentially allow the stratification to stay in place. That can only occur if you have small scale diabatic processes. Those diapratic processes have to have a certain rate, which is not easy to achieve certainly much bigger than molecular scale conductivities. Breaking inertia gravity waves do some of this, mostly generated by tides, but so does the submesoscale forward cascade. And finally, <clears throat> um, you can't make a model of the ocean and the atmosphere and try to integrate it forward in time without beginning to accumulate variance at small scales. So there clearly is just from that act a necessary energy sink, variant sink at small scales. This is traditionally accomplished by invoking eddy diffusivity coefficients that do what they have to. You make them strong enough to do so. But the question is, what's the actual process? For a coarse climate model of the ocean, this diffusivity represents the missing mesoscale. You're resolving the mesoscale eddies, then in fact the missing piece is the submesoscale. So it provides this regularization once you have small scales. And then finally, um, although I think the, the observational and modeling demonstration of this is less complete, there are many instances in the ocean where biological productivity continues to occur even though there's no obvious continuing source of nutrients, that is, you don't have upwelling, and you don't have you know, winter storms, typhoons, dip, mixing the boundary layer deeper and scouring up interior nutrients. And submesoscale flows, particularly fronts and filaments, have very large vertical velocities and vertical fluxes. And so they provide a means of sustained nutrient supply to the sunlit areas for productivity. Now, this is turbulent behavior that makes it hard science. 
the way forward has been led by models, which have seen it first, and the observation, you know, discounting astronauts' unexplained observations and things like that. Um, and the way that essentially has made it happen is multi, multiply nested open boundary grids in which you have a larger scale domain that establishes the large scale circulation and that context is necessary for the mesoscale and the submesoscale to emerge but then you have to have the finer scales available so they can emerge on their natural scale and you can't do that uniformly across big domains and fine scales. It's too big a computational problem, and so you can do so by nesting down. Um, and the experience is that when you do that, and people have only been doing that for not too many years, um, and you do it in a way that you're, you're smaller domains are not too much under boundary control of the larger scale flows, the open boundary conditions, so you allow a, a degree of free dynamics inside, then the submesoscales will spontaneously emerge. So let me give you an example of this. I'll set the cont and I'm going to do it visual entertainment. This is a surface relative vorticity field. That is just the vertical component of the curl uh, of the horizontal velocities. Um, it's a good way to see small scale strong flows. And this is a sector north that way of the Brazilian coast. It's in the middle of a subtropical gyre. It crosses the basin, which then has a strong western boundary current, which, which essentially provides the southward mass flux to balance the broad scale interior mass flux to the north. And if you had a time averaged current profile across here, there would be a systematic strong boundary current in this direction. But you kind of have trouble seeing that if you look at an instantaneous picture of the flow because you're dominated by small-scale structures that are lines, which will be fronts and filaments, vortices, um, sometimes you'll see a lot more vortices than others, even peculiar things like this, which it turns out are what are called rings, that is, these are mesoscale instabilities of the boundary current, Hiroshio has rings, um, but then they have sub-mesoscale instabilities around their edges. And in motion, um, you know, it doesn't look like a IPCC class, you know, global warming climate forecast model. It really is a sea of small vortices and filament lines and boundary currents. And here's a headland wake that creates a vortex sheet that then rolls up into small scale instabilities. You see a strong asymmetry between blue and red. It's an honest color bar. That asymmetry is that most of the vorticity here is in cyclonic vorticity, little cyclonic vortices and strong vorticity from cyclonic fronts. If you look at a, to see this emergence with the computational technique of refining the grid, here is a kinetic energy spectrum for a given domain, it happens to be an eastern boundary upwelling subtropical domain, as a function of horizontal wave number um, in radians, here is a, you know, a radian per kilometer, here's radian per 10 kilometers, radian per 100 kilometers, and the experimental design is simply to do the same open boundary condition external field with a succession of interior domain grids that range from about 12, which is a reasonable mesoscale resolution, down to below a kilometer. And what happens to the solution is that the mesoscale energy peak is more or less unchanged with resolution, but you fill out the higher wave numbers 
of the spectrum. You flatten the spectrum as you're flattening it towards k to the minus 2. You can even tell the difference between k to the minus 2 and k to the minus 5 thirds. This is a surface frontally dominated flow. And you can see the asymptotic convergence with resolution, or at least if your imagination is, is favorably inclined, um, in which as far as this calculation is showing, there's no end to this process. There's no smaller scale other than one being set by the, the artificial posing of, of the size of the grid. Of course, that's not going to be physically true, but as far as one can see over the scale ranges, it looks true here. If you look at the spectral energy transfer function, not from that flow, but by another idealized flow, which is in fact an example of what's called Edie's famous flow, where baroclinic instability, the source of atmospheric storms, was first done, but run in an equilibrium force damp situation to, to a steady statistical steady state. Here is the answer done with Charney's asymptotic model called quasi-geostrophic. And what you see is a systematic negative transfer to larger scales. That is, that's the answer in this asymptotic theory. And yet when you use a non-asymptotic model, you see a quite different answer of a very weak inverse cascade and a, a broad forward cascade. These two are qualitatively very different. This one allows a submesoscale. This one denies a submesoscale. If you decompose this transfer function into the part being transferred in kinetic energy forward, potential energy forward, then they are approximately flat over an intermediate range of wave numbers, suggesting an inertial range of constant flux. And they're in a kind of equipartition ratio of 3 to 1, suggesting this is a another kind of inertial cascade range, not geostrophic, not Kolmogorov. It'd be nice for some way to, someone to think of a simple scaling theory as to why this should be the answer. But at the moment, it's just an experimental result. <clears throat> Most important process in the solutions I just showed is, here's a sketch of frontogenesis. And the idea is that if you have in this direction a density gradient here from heavy to light fluid, and you look in the interior and that density gradient is concentrated near the surface, then there will be a balanced flow, which is in the sense of a surface intensified jet, along that gradient axis. If you also have what is historically called deformation flow, the flow here of horizontal flow is confluent, which is a flow of no divergence, no vorticity, uniform strain, then you will sharpen this horizontal gradient. The gradient is weak, you'll sharpen it at an exponential rate, which means it's sharpening very fast. Exponential is a fast function. You generate a secondary circulation by this combination of light fluid rising, heavy fluid sinking, which is an extraction of potential energy, also a increasing of the stratification, so it's a restratification process. It's also vortex stretching. You'll be stretching in a way that compresses against the surface, which has to have zero vertical velocity, or approximately zero. So you'll make anticyclonic vorticity on this side, cyclonic on this side. It is a very asymmetric process when the scale is small, such that the sinking motion and the cyclonic vorticity generation are much stronger than their rising anticyclonic counterparts. The rate is super exponential, faster than an exponential function. There are balance models of this process, famously one due to Hoskins and Bretherton, in which they predicted a finite time singularity, which if it were true, would give them the Clay, Min Clay Millennial Prize of proving or disproving the existence of solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, the fallacy, and we think it is a fallacy, they shouldn't get the prize. 
is that the flows don't remain balanced, breakdown of balance would occur. There's a, an analogous process which, instead of having a gradient in density across the axis, you have a central extremum. That's what's called a filament. Otherwise, the geometry is just the same. This is also a flow of super exponential shrinking rate. And now the secondary circulation concentrates into a central downwelling and central convergence, which means in addition to the sharpening induced by the deformation flow, the secondary circulation is also going to accentuate the sharpening. So in fact, this is even more explosively sharpening than fronts, which are their more famous counterpart. And in many places, they're a much more common structure. There's a strong asymmetry here that these two processes are additive in the sharpening rate if it's a cold filament, dense central line. They're opposing if it's a warm filament. So in fact, warm filaments are very boring and don't sharpen very strongly and are rarely observed. Furthermore, if you have a long axis non-uniformity, both of these are subject to frontal instability, which presumably will lead to frontal arrest, that is something to resist the sharpening because the unstable motions will provide fluxes across the axis in a way that will compete with the deformation sharpening. It's still very much an open question, you know, what the typical arrest instability is. It's a very good question. There are papers saying it is baroclinic instability for this, horizontal shear instability for this, but the issue is not fully settled. It's a very effective way to get in um, because these processes are, are so efficient. Here is just another set of examples that come from simulations that were done off Peru in which the common structure looked like this. This is in sea surface temperature, looking locally over a scale of radius 10 kilometers. It's got a cold core. That cold core is only two tenths of a degree. Um, it's got cyclonic arms. And furthermore, those arms are cold filaments. And so this begins to have the structure that the astronauts were seeing. If you look in either the vorticity or the vertical velocity, you see the characteristic filamentary structure of high cyclonic vorticity in the middle, high downward vertical velocity. If you scatter particles on the surface randomly and look two days later, then the particles are all gathered into these filamentary arms. So a, essentially a sub-mesoscale instability of a larger scale, perhaps front, that led to this vortex wrap up the wrap up and generating these filamentary scales. There's strong seasonality. This is in the same set of simulations, just a comparison of randomly scattered particles in winter and summer. Much better organized flow in winter. The monogenesis and frontal instability are processed. Happened in weakly stratified thick layer. Um, and so tip wintertime surface layer. The scales. If you look at the vertical buoyancy flux, which is equivalent to the potential to kinetic energy conversion with some horizontal and time averaging in a vertical profile, comparing a solution with rather coarse horizontal resolution and weak submesoscale, one that's otherwise the same except pretty good horizontal resolution, you see that there's a very strong enhancement by the submesoscale of the surface buoyancy flux to try to make a balance of the evolution of the density field, here rescaled as the so-called buoyancy field, then there'll be boundary layer turbulence flux 
vertically and connecting to the surface density fluxes. There may be on larger scales Ekman wind driven convergences, but there also is this sub restratification flux. It is acting against the turbulence and unmix the fluid in buoyancy, increase the vertical density gradient in a stable sense. Other mesoscales in the surface layer, excuse me, other materials in the surface layer also have. Here is a form of experimental confirmation. It's an experiment that was done by a team um, a few years ago, just off the coast of Japan, where there is a large scale confluence of two western boundary currents from the subpolar and subtropical gyre, Proshio and Oyashio. I deliberately use the word confluence, although that's not the common terminology. There is a density gradient between the gyres, separating boundary currents. And so in fact you have just the ingredients for frontogenesis, now not by some random you know, density gradient in the middle of, of the ocean, but of the Kuroshio front itself. The experimental design was to go here, release a bunch of floats, follow the floats of the ship going back and forth over a course of about three days. Here is a plot going down the center line of the horizontal buoyancy gradient, that is the frontal strength, you know, where this time axis and that distance axis are the same. And you see a period of strong frontogenesis that lasted a day or so. And then you saw a very short period of frontal destruction, which is to be interpreted as fertility. And if you calculate the energy dissipation rate by various measurement techniques here, then in these units, the typical energy dissipation rate of the ocean or even the boundary layer are much smaller, but you saw, an you saw an enormous spike in the energy dissipation rate at the end of the turbulent cascade that was started by this frontal instability. So here is in a single several day event a depiction of the kind of processes that we imagine typical of the submarine. Here is a movie. It's made from a nested simulation in the North Atlantic and it is for the Gulf Stream where it separates into the interior. So it's a little like the Kuroshio geometry. It's not you know, surface field, it's the depth integrated horizontal flow, often called the transport in ocean dynamics, taking the curl of it. So it's a kind of vorticity, but it's a vorticity not at a, a flow at a level, but the vorticity of a depth integrated flow. I like this partly you know, opaque grayscale because you can see both cyclonic curl and anticyclonic curl vorticity and you can see flows at different levels because it isn't as if the flow is depth uniform so you see through levels. Here is the Gulf Stream coming in along the coast. There is an illustration of a topographic wake, right, wake. That is, it just so happens there's a bump on the continental shelf there where systematically the flow goes by it. And when it goes by it, it is busy generating a wake that becomes extra unstable as it goes down. These, see the cyclonic white vorticity better than the dark in the Gulf Stream. It's here it develops large scale meanders, develops big rings that are cast off vortices, um, mostly cyclonic on the south. You also see there's a southward deeper flow, part of what's called the deep western boundary current, that is busy making little anticyclonic vortices all along this. That's another topographic. 
with these simulations, which are done by nested grids, um, we can see various submassive scale phenomena that are associated with the strong currents. Now here's this snapshot, several hundred kilometer scale of the 100 kilometer wide Gulf Stream in an instant. You're seeing two sub-mesoscale types of features here. One is some rather big vortices that are called frontal eddies or slope eddies or sometimes shingle eddies. These are in fact downstream products of the unstable wake over the Charleston bump. They've been observed for a long time, but their sort of formation process hadn't been understood. You also see these intruding cold filaments on a much smaller scale into the core of the Gulf Stream. We focus on the filament. Here is a snapshot now down to a scale of a width of you know, several kilometers of a cold density surface in what, when you subtract out the mean Gulf Stream flow, looks like a local confluent flow. That is, it's the element of filamentogenesis. If you look in a cross-sectional plane, you see the along filament two directional jets, which are what you expect from geostrophic balance and the colors, and you see surface convergence, downwelling in the core, and divergence at depth in the technocline. That is, this really looks like a elementary solution. If you look at a sequence of time pictures of the surface and just concentrate on the colors, these are four panels over a period of 18 hours. Here the filament is sharpening. Here it's reached sort of maximum sharpness. Here it's developing along filament wiggles that are its instability, and here the instability has essentially destroyed the, the filament and created some product small vortices. So there are recurrent life cycles of filaments in the Gulf Stream. There are other kinds of sub-mesoscale structures associated with different parts of the flow that I won't talk about. This is an illustration of strong di diabetic processes. Here's a snapshot horizontally at the surface, vertically in cross-section temperature. But there are these white lines and white dots. The white dot is where a particular tracked particle is at an instant we'll call T naught. Here it is horizontally, here it is vertically. So here it is in the middle of the filament horizontally and sort of near the surface here. And these white lines represent the trajectories in time before and after the particles following. If you plot following a particle the density, coming into the filament as warm light water rapidly changing over a few hours cold dense water and then coming out of the filament in a way that preserves its density here and here but rapidly changes it here when it back its second circulation this is in the midst of a turbulent boundary layer so there's plenty of potential for Mixing in the presence of strong density gradients, which of course a filament has. It's a diapicnal mixing process of some strong efficiency too, and in the ocean general circulation, such things are to be looked for because they are typically not very strong. The last topic is essentially the topographic wake dynamics, and here's a cartoon. Imagine you have a sloping bottom, and imagine you have an interior flow of flow along that slope. Along the slope. Um, and you're gonna, because you have to accommodate a no-slip condition with surface drag at the bottom when you're next to the boundary, it means a vertical profile will be uniform in the interior, and then it'll have a vertical boundary layer shear due to boundary layer turbulence doing vertical mixing. But because it's on a slope, it means this red profile will be a, like a red profile here, except it'll be shifted downward, because you'll have a similar boundary layer depth h, but it will be at a lower level here. 
So that means that if you make a horizontal cross-section of, of the, the current, it will be uniform interior and now a horizontal shear going into the boundary. Horizontal shear is vertical vorticity. Vertical vorticity is the fuel for strong instabilities in rotating stratified fluids. This, the strength of this will be the slope times turbulent vertical boundary layer shear. And so as long as you have a perhaps substantial stroke, uh, slope, you can in fact generate vorticity that is much stronger than the Coriolis frequency. That is, you can generate high Rossby number of vorticity by this mechanism. And you will whenever you have flow along the slope. Now, simulation, this is off California. Here is the California undercurrent, which is you know, poleward flow below the surface, maybe about three tenths of a meter per second at peak, horizontal scale, five to ten kilometers, but a very narrow shear zone right next to the boundary on the slope, so that if you plot the vertical vorticity of this, it is a strong sheet of anticyclonic vorticity several times f in its strength um, associated with long slope flow. Now, imagine this more or less uniform configuration approaches a headland and a bay. This bay is called Monterey Bay. Here is the vorticity from the upstream section at a particular vertical level coming to a point where the flow separates because the bottom turn and there's inertia to the flow. And once it separates in a, a violent instability, this happens to be centrifugal instability, sometimes called inertial or symmetric instability, too, and you get very active submesoscale turbulence here. And because the submesoscale itself is partly rotating stratified, there's a degree of is upscale organization, and so in fact this will turn into a large submesoscale vortex that is identified as a well-formed beginning of a submesoscale coherent vortex that can be out in the interior with long lifetime. In this location, they're not called Mediterranean; they're called California under other. Um, just to summarize, this is all pretty new, um, which of course makes it scientifically good fun. It makes it a good scientific future subject because there's a lot still left to do. It occurs quite widely. You see it as convergence lines, fronts and filaments in the surface layer. See these features in slightly different forms and strong currents. The topographic wakes near the bottom and then coherent vortices in the interior at all depths. The frontogenesis caused by deformation flows that are really mesoscale eddy flows is the primary scale contraction mechanism and then the instabilities off of that further feed the, the forward cascades. It involves a degree of loss of balance so the forward cascades can happen. Um, which continues all the way down to the microscale with diapycnal mixing and energy dissipation. Big vertical velocities lead to density restratification in, in buoyancy flux and other vertical fluxes, particularly in the surface layer. It dominates the lateral mixing and spreading of materials in this intermediate scale range, sort of 110 kilometer separation. On larger scales, the mesoscales dominate the separation. Separation rates increase with scale. <coughs> it's a common behavior of turbulence with red spectra. And all this phenomenology and the kind of dynamical understanding that we are pursuing essentially gives us a framework for trying to properly justify how flow should be initialized for forecast and how the effects of submesoscale should be represented in larger scale models like climate models.
Excuse me. Didn't mean to cough into the microphone. Surface fronts in the atmosphere are well known. Yes. They're usually not observed or noted unless there's some good cloud band and precipitation associated with it. But it's a generic process, and so they will be there. They may be go there with a few tenths of a degree temperature signals rather than you know, five degrees. They won't be always the big storm front. And what I think this will do for air pollution is it will provide some vertical chimneys. And in the case of the atmosphere, the asymmetry is updraft. So you're used to updrafts from your boundary layer turbulence. There will be times you will have on the you know, boundary layer turbulence on the one kilometer kind of scale, you'll have submesoscale structures on 10 to 100 kilometers scale. Now, whether it really matters for a given air pollution situation will depend a lot on the synoptic situation. In the atmosphere, the best visualization people have, if it's not pollution crowds, clouds, is you know, water vapor clouds. And of course, those are typically associated with particular storm structures and, and such. And because the ocean doesn't have a, a, a cloud water vapor condensation process, this is probably a better picture of what's happening between the clouds than is what's happening in the clouds. And of course, all the processes are there. Um, you know, the real problem with air pollution is the emission. Um, the long time pollution is largely by large mesoscale <coughs> flows, just like the large time spreading is by mesoscale flows in the ocean. But you know, I would think that there, there would be times, particularly if you have a smokestack on a windy day near a mountain ridge, in which you would find these kinds of structures really play a role. Well, sometimes during a frontal passage, we see the pollution coming in. That's an example, and we just come to see with ocean surface imaging, which is generally better than atmospheric imaging, except for the cloud aspects, that these things under the right boundary layer conditions, which typically are rather deep boundary, are just everywhere. So they have to be in the atmosphere, sometimes, someplace. Do you have a little bit of a sense of um, th these mesoscale fl flows seem like they would be geographically quite varied in terms of their intensity and significance? They are. And, um, it, it seems that they could be a fairly important mixing mechanism for bringing nutrients to the surface. They don't have strong vertical circulations. By being in a balanced state, in the sense I'm using the word, they are essentially horizontal flows whose particles are carried on surfaces of constant density or constant entropy or however you measure the gravitational stratification. So, I mean, there are mesoscale effects, but frequent supply of more nutrients doesn't appear to be one. I mean, it's, it's they keep hoping, they keep looking. There are some places where they think they have examples. But, these have the advantage of strong vertical flux profiles of all materials, including nutrients, just in the place where the photic zone might be about that thick. 
and reach into the so-called neutrocline, which is the gradient of nutrients from depleted at the surface to abundant at depth, um, in a way that the mesoscale eddies usually don't. The first part of my question sort of had to do with the um, global distribution. It seems like there are very specific structures that are producing high intensity, some mesoscale effects fairly predictably in certain areas, isn't it? I think or this has to be you know, something like a world's best place to see these processes because nothing is as strong as the Kuroshio and as sharp as its north wall. They'll be less strong elsewhere, but they are typically strong compared to the location. For example, the frontogenesis rate is essentially at the rate of velocity derivative, so-called strain rate, of the mesoscale flow. In strong mesoscale regions, that's a strong rapid rate of frontal tightening. In weaker mesoscale rates, regions, it'll be a weaker rate, but still, it, it will be proportionally as important in a given location to everything else going on in that location. But yes, there, there's strong geographical variability of mesoscale flows, and so there'll be strong geographical variability of the sub-mesoscale as well. We have a pretty good picture of the geographical variability of the mesoscale. The satellite altimetry has given us that. There are not standard measures from space of the sub-mesoscale features. They're just sort of some lucky observations when the clouds are clear and or the astronauts in the right place or something. So we don't know the geography very well yet. Any? Yes. Uh, I, I want to, uh, I, I, in your t uh, presentation, you saw some model results. It's better that when you change the horizontal resolution of the uh, the model, that that movie shows many uh, details. And uh, oh yeah, this one. And you said if we uh, decrease the uh, the horizontal res uh, resolution or refine the uh, uh, horizontal grid, we will uh, much better to resolve this kind of very important uh, subject. And they will just emerge yeah, but without any further help. Okay, but uh, in, in uh, most of the Earth's major Earth simulator we download from the website, for example, high come out and things like that, their resolution is about 10 kilometers this kind yeah. of scale. They're struggling to do an adequate job with the mesoscale. Okay, so. And so they're just not seeing this. Okay, so uh, what about the RPCC that report their results? They haven't a clue. Yes, but how will you comment there? <laughs> Their results, could we trust that? For example, the one kind of... They're as good as our culture has been able to make. <laughs> they are a global answer within the feasible technology of present whole Earth simulation. Now, how will that answer change? Not when you, you know, reduce the grid of the global model to, uh, sorry, I wanted this list, you know, to 100 meters, because no one's going to do that yes. in the lifetime of anyone in this room. Okay. Rather, what you need to do is you need to think about process and say, well, what is it the submassive scales are doing to the larger scale flows, for example, Restratifying boundary layers after storms go away. And what are the ways to represent that and what are the rates? And now let's make a parameterization. Let's put it in a, put it in an ICC, IPCC model and see what difference it makes. Okay. And my guess is the two biggest differences it's going to make are actually, well, I mean, in a sense, you don't need to worry about the forward energy cascade because they have all the eddy diffusivity they want. They just don't know why they have it. They have it, so that no, won't, the energy cycle won't change. But what will change is things like boundary layer depth and 
ichnocline surface layer fluxes. And there are certainly known biases in boundary layer depths of present IPCC models. Um, they may also, actually I should say one more, insofar as these separating boundary currents that become submesoscale unstable have a lot of diapycnal mixing in their instability region, that may well change some interior stratifications. There's been a hypothesis in oceanography sort of historically associated with Chris Garrett for a long time that all the important diapycnal mixing in the ocean interior must occur at the boundaries because we know, because they can't find it in the interior. And people have known for a long time about bottom boundary layers. And that gives you a certain amount of diapycnal mixing near the bottom. But here's another process that can greatly amplify the diapycnal mixing due to separating boundary currents, well beyond just what the boundary layer does, although the boundary layer is playing an absolutely essential role in creating the high vorticity in the boundary current on a small scale that then is the food for instability once flow separation occurs. So this might lead to changing the vertical mixing coefficients in some geographically intelligent way in the interior of the ocean, which, which of course starts to touch on the thermohaline circulation and other things. But it's going to be if, if you're going to change the IPCC answer, or at least try to further improve it, you're going to do so through parameterizations based on knowledge of process. This flies in the face of the geostrophic turbulence theory that says balance flow should have inverse energy cascade. And so at least with respect to the fields, like let's say dynamic height or even velocity, most of the energies at larger scales, the turbulence theory says it go to even larger scales, which means if you look at the velocity field, you won't see it break down into small. Oh, I, I know that. I mean, you may have low co-instability break those large eddy, okay. those, those large visual scale eddy. But you can't systematically have that local instability to small eddies or you would be putting energy into smaller scales. So you really got to break balance to have what you describe. Now what you describe happens, but I think it happens by essentially sub scale processes, not geostrophic processes. Oh, because I personally look at something shallow, Geostrophic balance, of course, it is broken. And I look at coherent vortex in the more smaller scale. Maybe the. Okay, well, we might is. be able to negotiate agreement about your results, but we probably both have to look at them to have that discussion. Okay. You had a question, Gun? Yes. Now, in besides the increase the greater resolution, in order to resolve this uh, as an effect, what kind of physics do we need to take at the same time? Say it in the maximum. From a purely technical point of view, technology of numerics, you need big subdomains. In my eye, some of your subdomains are that big because you want to be free from excessive boundary control. You need small model fusion or else you'll just suppress this activity by damping. Um, the real transition in physics beyond those technical things would come when you reach non-hydrostatic behaviors. 
we don't know where the non-hydrostatic limits of these flows lie. There's a pretty good history in ocean science that when people are doing sort of balanced flows rather than, say, internal gravity waves, they do a lot of work to make a non-hydrostatic model to compare to a hydrostatic, then they write boring papers saying, gee, they're about the same. These processes, the ones that push down the scale, will reach non-hydrostatic limits. My guess is those limits will be about when the horizontal scale is of a feature like a front or something like that is like the vertical boundary layer scale, that is some tens of meters. But we don't really have published answers to that question. Another possible limit would be if you started spontaneously emitting a whole bunch of inertia gravity waves. These things do emit inertia gravity waves and, and just bring this up. If you look in other ways in a place like this where you have a very intense sub mesoscale instability going on, um, there are actually a fair number of inertia gravity waves. They're not particularly evident in this picture, but still small compared to the at the more adaptive part of the flow. I'm sure there are situations, for example, lee waves over a mountain in which the inertia gravity wave emission can be strong. It just doesn't appear to be very typical, at least in the scale ranges that we've explored. So those are ways that you would need physics beyond what we're currently using. The world will get there. How can we know it is right or wrong to say the that feature, given that, that we may be defective that is features in this scale? We do experiments. Of course, the experiment is and, not always available. Oh, well, I understand. You know, this was extraordinarily expensive and effortful. Um, and we look at the experimental results and say, does it make sense by the ideas we have? And this one does. Or we make bigger, better models and we test it, not hydrostatically or otherwise. But there's always the, I think this is what you're prodding me to say, with the benefit of young minds, there's always the possibility that we're fooling ourselves with our models. So we need to be careful. But in the meantime, it's a lot of fun. And beginning to feel like it makes sense as a coherent story. So I think we're not mostly wrong. How about tidal road in this country versus the SM the scale? Of course they're connected, but somehow there's also the difference. My, my, my sense is that in most situations, they largely superimpose. That is, they're both going on but they're not very strongly coupled. One case where I know that's not true is when you have strong tidal flows and your strong topography like headlands, you will make vortical wakes that will be advectively unstable just as boundary currents can make vortical wakes. And so there will be times that topographic wakes and tides will behave this way. Say the invasive scale. Uh, the case without resolving SM effect, or the case without resolving the tidal effect. This effect, tidal effect, this effect. Which one is worse? If you held an election among ocean scientists, they would say the extra diapicnal mixing from topographically generated internal tides propagating upwards and breaking well below the thermocline is the bigger effect if you're trying to explain the stratification of the ocean. On the other hand, they have never really looked for what the diapicnal mixing of the submesoscale might be. But the election would elect tides. Okay. Uh, I have last question. Is the SM the Mesoscale, the uh, 
activity is always no bonnets. It, it's a funny animal. It's mostly balanced. Mostly balanced. But in the sense that if you see a density field, you just let's go to plots like this. The and, and these plots are ignoring the turbulent boundary layer, which, which is another way to be unbalanced. Just think of Ekman flows. But here is a down front flow. Here is a pair, I didn't say it when I talked about it, of opposite down filament flows on the two sides. You don't do badly in calculating these along axis flows with a geostrophic calculation. And yet these secondary circulations in these down front uniform situations are completely unbalanced. And so this is usually the stronger flow, but this is doing things that this can't. So it's a mixture of balanced and unbalanced, but it's not completely balanced like a quasi-geostrophic theory would assume. When you're talking about, uh, you also mentioned the uh, arrest. Where you the if, if this happens on a scale that is big enough such that, for example, a balanced baroclinic instability or a balanced barotropic instability might do the arrest, then that might also look pretty balanced. But as the scale gets smaller and smaller at a super exponential rate, and if the instability hasn't broken it up yet, then the theoretical growth rate of that instability gets faster and faster at a rate that is bigger than the rate of this is getting sharper, and the more it gets down to small scales and large Rossby numbers, the less balanced it will be. And so, for example, the interpretation of, of this event, that is, you went from a very strong front to the front being destroyed in a few hours. Interpretation of this, partly because a man named Lee Thomas was involved and he likes this argument, is that you had a centrifugal instability and a centrifugal instability is an unbalanced type of instability. And so in this instance, the thought is that the arrest, and here's the arrest, it went from blue to red. Or the, the increasing blueness stopped and even reversed. Um, in this case, it was by an apparently unbalanced instability. I think both possibilities are there. There are probably different arrest processes in different situations. But just generically, some kind of instability of the sharpening front or filament is what will do the arrest. And it will, it happens at a three kilometer scale, it might be pretty balanced. If it happens at a 30 meter scale, it's probably pretty unbalanced. But I'm sure you can drive boats around your coastal waters, particularly near the edge of the Pearl River plume, in which you will see fronts, garbage fronts, that are very narrow. And so somehow that's gotten to a small scale without an arrest, well, without a balanced instability. It might not even be a very balanced front. Uh, we have, uh, in the community, we have a parameterization the, about the SN effect already targeting the SN effect I'm talking about. One effect you would want to parameterize is this vertical buoyancy flux in the surface layer. You can associate that with a baroclinic instability process and make a submesoscale parameterization for this that is very much in the spirit of the standard mesoscale parameterization used in general circulation models, which is based on the idea of baroclinic instability. 
So the idea people use in doing that is they say there's an eddy-induced Lagrangian mean flow, <coughs> analogous to a Stokes drift of surface gravity waves as a Lagrangian mean flow for surface gravity waves, and that does an advection of the large-scale buoyancy field, and, and that represent and that tends to flatten isopycnals, reduce the available potential energy, and that represents the parameterization. A man named Baylor Fox Kemper has proposed such a framework for the shallow eddy-induced circulation cells of submesoscales accompanying one that you don't see in this picture of the deeper one that is sort of thermocline scale. Um, you know, time will tell whether that's a good idea or not. But you make parameterizations based on the effects you're trying to accomplish in some mathematically safe and elegant way to express them. And then you try to calibrate them. You try to see if the effects are beneficial. And for the most part, that has not been done. I think the main thing people will calibrate against is whether they get bottom, better bottom boundary, be, better surface boundary layer depths in their climate simulations. That's what this, that's the large scale variable that this will most directly affect. Thanks, Professor McWilliam, for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.